Good morning. Good, morning. Oh, good to see all of you here and these wonderful chairs that are here. It's so, so good to, to uh, at least have a place to sit. Uh, we got to remember, it's good. It's a good thing. Greetings to everybody that's online and especially to our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. I, we are certainly praying for you and, and praying that uh, the recovery and cleanup from all the rain and flooding uh, you know, goes smoothly. Yeah, we're just so, so uh, uh, sorry that you're having to go through all of it. I tell you, Pastor Mark, I was, as um, Kathy was sharing, I was thinking, Hillcrest, Pakistan? Might end up being bigger than Hillcrest Jamestown if uh, things keep going on that trajectory there. That's fantastic. Um, before, before I dive into uh, Joshua this morning, I do want to <coughs> excuse me, acknowledge my mother-in-law, Beth McKenna. Uh, today, she is uh, celebrating the anniversary of her 39th birthday. So we are very uh, excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it is good. This is really good. Ah, yeah, I am in a little bit of trouble. That's okay. That's okay. All right, I want to take you back in time a little bit. We're going we're gonna to go back to January 3rd of 1993. Yeah, we're going back a little ways. So, um, it's a day I, I will always, always, always remember this day. Now, last week, Pastor Mark uh, referenced the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and I think aptly in, in his sermon and their tendency to, to follow a, a rousing, awesome victory with a head-scratching defeat. I thought that was a really apt analogy. But, uh, and, and I thought I'd share my own Bill's memory. I, I'm not a fan. It's not my team. I know I live near here, but that's not. But I do root for them occasionally. Uh, and so I'm going to share my Bill's memory. Now, so January 30, it was a cold day which is not a shocker considering you're in Buffalo in January. It was a cold day. And the Bills were taking on the Houston Oilers. And it was the first week, the first game of the NFL playoffs. Now, they actually had played the same team the week before. It was the last game of the regular season, and they got whooped. I mean, Buffalo, they got soundly defeated by Houston. So, you know, mood going into this game is, eh, we'll see. Well halfway through the second quarter. We're not even halfway through the game yet. And it was just ugly. I, 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 don't even, I honestly thought that the University of Buffalo could have done better than the Bills were doing on that day. It was not pretty. We're not even halfway through the game, and the Bills are losing 35-3. to three. Okay, if it were 80 degrees and sunny, okay, you might tolerate it's January in Buffalo, playoff tickets are not cheap, and the team's down 35 to 3. It's, it's not a pretty scene. A lot of people left before halftime. A lot of people left because it's cold, it's miserable, they're getting destroyed. That's just, that's, no, that's not fun. No fun in it at that point. But then something happened. I, I don't even know what happened. I don't know if some coach gave the most rousing speech in the history of coaches' speeches. I don't know if there was an invisible switch that God decided to flip. But everything just changed. And all of a sudden, the Bills looked like the Super Bowl team that they would be that year. And played ridiculously well and ended up coming back and eventually winning the game in overtime, 41-38. to 38. Un but here, I even put a picture up there for all you Bills fans. Look at that. And it's really bad that I know most of those players. I can remember that. But you see number 14, Frank Reich. So he was the quarterback because Jim Kelly was hurt that year, although Jim Kelly did come back and play in the Super Bowl. Frank Reich also led the biggest comeback in college football history when he was the quarterback at Maryland. So that's kind of, Frank Reich was really good at that stuff, coming back from it. You know, I was at that game. And I got to tell you, that place was nuts. It was crazy. At least for those of us that actually stayed. It was crazy. You know that Bill Shout song? I think they played it for like an hour straight. It, it was insane. I hugged more complete strangers than I ever have in my entire life. I was high five and I don't even know. Everybody. It was awesome. And it was awesome because you know what? Everybody loves a comeback story. 
And I love that, that, that when you, when you, looks like you're just down and out and that's it, and you come back and achieve victory. Everybody loves that comeback story. And that's what we have in our text this morning. Well, last week, Pastor Mark, he was in chapter 7, and he, and he talked about the terrible experience the Israelites had with this city of Ai. And we learned a really great lesson about, <coughs> excuse me, what happens when we try to do things on our own, when we try to do things without seeking out God's guidance or God's help first. The Israelites had become overconfident, and it cost them dearly. So let's turn in our chair Bibles. I like that word, chair Bibles. <coughs> Excuse me, to chapter 8. And let's find out what happens next, because, you know, chapter 7, it, it was a pretty down mood at the end of chapter 7. And let's start right at the beginning, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack I. Right off the bat, right in this first verse, everything's completely different. We already have a huge difference between now and before, between chapter 8 and chapter, or chapter 7. Because this is not the Israelites deciding, hey, let's go attack I. It looks easy. This is God directing them what to do. Go and do this. He's, he's telling them what to do. And I love what God says right off the bat to Joshua. He says, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So we have five lessons in this, in this chapter today. And this is our first, our first lesson. God never forsakes his children, no matter how they fail him. I love that. Now, as we learned last week, the Israelites had failed miserably. They had failed God. And it cost them. It cost them dearly. They had to run away from the city. 36 men died. But God just doesn't abandon them. He doesn't turn his back and say, well, you should have listened. You didn't bother with my help, so I'm out. Good luck. Good luck to y'all. He doesn't do that. He doesn't turn, their back and abandon, turn his back and abandon them because they had gotten off track. They recognized their sin. They repented of their sin. And God stood by them every step of the way. Now, I try to put my, myself in Joshua's shoes, because I can imagine it's got to be a pretty low time in, in Joshua's life right now. I mean, he's the leader. And, and everything went really badly. They had just suffered this humiliating defeat. I can imagine the mood in, in, in their camp was quite low, quite bad. Everybody's probably grumbling and complaining and scratching their heads and wondering what's going on. And Joshua was probably questioning himself as a leader. Oh, maybe, I, maybe I'm in the wrong gig. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And then here comes God to build him back up when he was down, to reassure Joshua of the promises that he had made to him. And it's just amazing to know that we have a God that doesn't turn his back on us, doesn't withdraw his blessing simply because we fail. So we go on in the chapter. God said to him, take the whole army with you and go up and attack I. We're already at our second lesson, and we're only one verse in. I mean, don't, we, don't worry, we don't have 35 lessons. We're not, we're not going to have a lesson per verse. But we do. Right off the bat, we already have our second lesson, and it's a great one. Don't repeat your mistakes. <laughs> yeah, great. Now, there's a, a famous quote that's often attributed to Albert Einstein. Some people said he borrowed it from somebody else, or, you know, but... Most of, mostly it's attributed to Albert Einstein. And it's the definition of insanity. It says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Now, thankfully, Joshua was not insane. This time, God tells him, take the whole army to attack I. If you go back to chapter 7, remember the people went and scouted out I, and they're like, oh, ah, oh, this is easy. There's hardly anybody there. Send 3,000 men. That'll be more than enough. They, they probably thought that was overkill, even with 3,000 people. And look what happened. It didn't go very well for them. Well, this time, nope, whole army. Now, obviously, one of the reasons for their earlier defeat was Aachen's sin, who disobeyed what God had told them to, to do, and there was a punishment there, but they had become overconfident in themselves. They hadn't sought out the Lord. 
They figured they could take this city on their own. It's no problem. It's tiny. There's hardly anybody there. No problem. They were not going to repeat their mistake. Chapter goes on. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Notice that. It's already done. They haven't attacked it yet, but he said, I've already handed it over to you. You shall do to Ai and its kings as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Achan should have waited. He would have gotten his stuff that he wanted. So it set an ambush behind the city. That leads us to our third lesson. We're already three lessons in this quickly. <laughs> third lesson for today. You may be called to return to the scene of a prior defeat. Now, God's call on Joshua was to go back to Ai. The, the scene of absolute humiliation. They were humiliated there. And I wonder, again, how was Joshua feeling? Because he had to still be reeling from everything that had happened. He's probably still lacking in confidence. He's probably still very, very embarrassed. And I'm certain, I, I'm absolutely certain that attack I was not on his to-do list. I, I highly doubt that he even gave a second thought about attacking I again. But this time it was going to be different. Because this time, God was in charge. It was God directing things. This time, the Lord was with them. And God promised Joshua, I will turn this place of defeat into a place of victory. This place where you suffered humiliation will now be a place of celebration. And what Joshua and the Israelites were discovering is that even the smallest things can defeat us when we do not have God with us. Even the smallest things can defeat us if we don't have God with us. Think about, let's think about the history, well, not the entire history, but the recent history for the Israelites at that time. So with God's power, with God's presence, and with God's guidance, they were able to conquer a city as mighty and powerful as Jericho. These thick, tall walls that surrounded Jericho came crumbling down. They were able to defeat the mighty Jericho. But without God's power, without God's presence, and without God's guidance, even a small, tiny, little city like I was too much for them to handle. They couldn't handle it. Something that small, even the smallest things can defeat us when we don't have God with us. <clears throat> but by returning to this place of defeat, God was showing them, you need me. <laughs> You need my power, you need my presence, you need my guidance. I can turn humiliation into victory. Let's keep moving on in chapter 8. So Joshua and the whole army moved to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully, you are to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you be on the alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city, and when the men come out against us as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city, for they will say, they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. See to it. You have my orders. I think it's you know, awesome that God, you know, is using their previous defeat to springboard them into victory. And, and it's even better than just that, because you look at the plan that God gives to them in verses 5 and 6. So the men of Ai are going to come out and chase the Israelites, because that's exactly what they did in chapter 7. They ran out and chased the Israelites, and the Israelites ran away. And in chapter 7, the Israelites ran away. They hunted 36 of them down and, and killed the 36, and, and the Israelites were humiliated. But this time, they're going to think they're running away just like before, and they aren't ready for what God has planned for them. God is actually taking advantage of what happened in their previous defeat and using it to bring victory this time. 
And so that is kind of our fourth lesson for this morning, is that God uses mistakes to achieve victory. To me, that sounds an awful lot about what you know, was going in Paul's head. It was going through Paul's head when he wrote in Romans 8, 28, which is a, just probably one of the most well-known verses in the New Testament. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It says all things, all things, good things, bad things. He will take the good, he will take the bad. And he will work it out for good. It doesn't mean we aren't going to suffer consequences. Of course we are. We have to suffer consequences for our mistakes. 36 men died. 36 men lost their lives because of Israel's failures. But it was not the end, and it's never the end when it comes to God, because he can take our mistakes and use them to accomplish his will. He will take our mistakes and turn them into victory. Now, verses 9 through 29 kind of tell the rest of the story. It tells the story about how all of this played out. We're not going to go into a deep dive into those 20 verses or, or whatever. You know, the brief synopsis, it worked perfectly. Of course it did. It was God's plan, so of course it worked perfectly. The Israelites tricked the men of I. The men of I came running out because they're thinking, woohoo, we're going to win again. And they got trapped. And when they realized they, went, they were trapped, it was like, uh-oh. They got trapped. The Israelites were able to take control of the whole city. What they had been unable to do themselves, God was able to do through them. It's the same group, but it was God working this time. And now their humiliation had been wiped away, and God gave them victory over their enemies. But I do want to look at the last. Uh, ben didn't read them, and, and that's fine because there was a lot of verses to read. But I want us to look at verses 30 to 35, which is the end of chapter 8. Then Joshua built on Mount Abal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There, in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites, with their elders, officials, and judges, were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the foreigners living among them and the native-born were there. Half of the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formerly commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. All right, that was very wordy way of saying our final truth. Now, following this rousing victory over I, the Israelites didn't throw like a big banquet. Uh, they didn't throw this huge party. You know, they didn't have this gigantic celebration with dancing and music and I don't know, you know, whatever they, camel races, I, you know, whatever they do to celebrate back. And I, I don't know, but it, it's our final lesson. What they did is our final lesson this morning. Remember the source of our blessings. They didn't throw a big party. When, when, when the Israelites tried to take I without God's help, they failed. And they failed badly. When they turned to the Lord and followed his commands, they experienced victory. The only difference between those two events is God was in one and not the other. That's the difference. So Joshua was obeying the command given by Moses in Deuteronomy 27. He had the people travel to a valley in between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim where he built an altar and he carried out a service, a worship service in recognition that their victory was entirely and completely dependent upon God. That was the first thing they did acknowledge God. It is important for us to remember where our blessings come from. You know, as Pastor Mark touched on last week, sometimes we get full of ourselves. Yep. Especially when things are going well. The Israelites are a great example. Things are going great. They defeated mighty Jericho. Everything's fantastic. And they started to get a little arrogant. They started to get, you know, kind of big heads. 
a little full of themselves, and they started to rely on themselves, their own wisdom, their own strength. And we know how that went. It didn't go good. Joshua wanted to make sure that everyone knew where this victory had come from. It had nothing to do with them. God won the victory. And so the people took the necessary steps to make sure that they were giving honor and glory to God. All right, so we had the five lessons, but there are some things that I would like us to take from those lessons because I think they apply really, really well to today. So we're going to ask that question that, that we ask most weeks. Most weeks. So I'm going to count to three. We're going to ask that question together. One, two, three. So what? All right, so what? What in the world does the city of I have to do with Jamestown, New York? So let's, let's, let's be reminded of the lessons that the Israelites learned because there are some things for us to take from those lessons. First lesson was God never forsakes his children no matter how they fail him. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I have had, uh, I've experienced, and I know Pastor Mark has too, Many people over the years who believed that they were just too far gone, that they had sinned too much, um, that there's no, they, they crossed that line, that there's no possible way that God would want anything to do with them, would want, would want them back. Uh, I was doing a wedding, and the bride called me up a couple weeks before the wedding, just in tears. So, of course, in my mind, I'm like, what'd the groom do? Yeah. <laughs> Just wondering, oh, no, what's going on? Let me guess, the chairs are the wrong color, or I don't know, you know, somebody got a bad haircut. Could be anything. No, it was actually something pretty serious. Her aunt that she is very close to was not coming to the wedding because it was being held in a church. And that really upset her, and I can understand why. That was upsetting to her. So I reached out to the aunt. I was like, can we talk? Because I, I, I need to know what, what's going on here. You know, did you have a bad experience? Um, you know, can we talk this through? So we, we did. We met for coffee. And I, and I just bluntly asked her, why are you not coming? Because it's at a church. If it were not at a church, would you come to the wedding? Yes. So why are you not coming? Just because of a building it's in. And she's, her response was, was simply this, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. Is she said, there's no way God would want me there. My life's a mess. I've screwed up so many times. There's no way that God would want anything to do with me. And, and, and she actually did say this part. She says, if I step foot in that church, I bet he sends a lightning bolt to strike me down or set the church on fire. No matter how hard I tried, no matter cajoling, begging, pleading, guilt tripping, everything I tried to do to get her to come to that wedding, she didn't come. She wouldn't step foot in that church. She wouldn't step foot in any church because she truly believed as unfortunately a lot of people do she's too far gone for god to forgive her to that i just say hogwash I, nope because our god is a god of forgiveness mercy and grace he will never ever turn his back on a repentant heart ever there is not a single solitary thing that you could possibly do that would ever cause God to turn his back on you. If you are one of those people who struggles with feelings like this, now obviously if you're here this morning, you aren't struggling with the idea that you can't step foot in a church, because you're here. But if you ever struggle with those feelings of, I wonder, if you're questioning, am I really saved? I, you know, I've done some really bad things in the past. I don't know if God, if you're here hoping that you can earn enough credits, uh, maybe someday God will like you if I earn enough. If I come to church every Sunday, maybe that'll be enough. If, that's, if you ever feel that way, I, I really I urge you to please come talk to one of the pastors because the most important thing for us, I mean, church is important in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things we want to share with you about God, but the most important thing for us is that we want you to know and experience the God of grace, love, mercy and forgiveness above all second lesson we talked about was don't repeat your mistakes so much easier said than done i mean oh boy i'm probably gonna hear it for this one but i mean 
How many times have Bills fans said, this is our year? <laughs> Remember that definition of insanity? All right. Okay. We need to learn from our mistakes and avoid making the same ones over and over and over again. I know that, I mean, that's not earth shattering, but it's a truth that we really do need to think about. Now, I know none of you are insane, I think. But I, I, I know nobody believes that if you do the same thing over and over and over again, if you just do that enough times, eventually the result will be different. We know that's not the case. It's not going to be different. We can mess up. Okay? We're going to mess up. But when we do, we have to do the hard work. And the hard work is acknowledging before God we messed up, asking him to forgive our sins and learning from it and, and, and fighting the temptation to make that same mistake over and over and over again. That's hard work because it's very easy to fall into a pattern of repeating the same mistake over and over again. We don't want to do that. We don't want to fall into a pattern of doing the same mistake over and over again. If you find yourself in that situation, you need to talk to somebody and get help to break that cycle. Because you don't want to be, it's fine to mess up, but if you're doing the exact same thing for 30 straight years, We've got a bigger problem to deal with. The third lesson we had was you might be called to return to the scene of a prior defeat. You know, when, when we mess up, I think one of our first responses, and a very healthy response, is to avoid the things that led to that mistake. Okay? That's a good response. That's learning. Aha, if I go there, this happens. I'm not going there. That's a good way to avoid the, the temptation or the problem uh, that led you to, to, to your mistake. It's a natural defense mechanism. But there are times when God is going to say, nope, you are going back to that place. I want you to go back to that place. And he will lead you there. And that can be scary. That can be really scary. The difference is, the same difference between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Same place, different companion. This time, if he does ever call you back into a place that was the scene of maybe a humiliation or a defeat or, or you really messed up, if God leads you back into those waters, you're going with him this time. And that's a big difference. Because when we are following God, when we're letting him lead us, that place doesn't have to be scary. We don't have to fear making the same mistakes because God can take us to that place and completely change the outcome. Same place, different result. Just like I. Same city, vastly different result. Big difference was God led them to that place. So if that happens to you, if you feel like God leading you to a place that like, God, this was not a good spot for me, I, I don't want to go. It scares me. I don't want to get in that same trouble. Embrace it. Embrace it because you know that God is capable of redeeming any situation that you can find yourself in. Fourth lesson we learned was get, God uses mistakes to achieve victory. But I tell you, one of the most amazing things about God is how he makes miracles out of messes. Love it. I love it. How he takes a mess and creates something beautiful out of it. I've experienced that full well in my own life because I have made some monumental mistakes. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I have watched how God has worked those things and, and turned mess, the mess that I've created into something beautiful. One of my favorite images about you know, God, and pictures of God is, is in, in scripture is, is him as a potter. See, I am not artistic. My stick figures are disfigured. They just, they don't look right, okay? I can't draw, I can't sculpt, I can't paint, except I can paint walls, but that's about it. I can't do any of that stuff, so it gives me a great appreciation of people that can. I absolutely love looking at the, the things that other people create and, their, and the talents that God has blessed them with, and God is so talented. I love that when it, the scripture talks about it as the potter and that we're the clay, because I can identify as a lump of clay. 
It's unremarkable. Just kind of there. Not very pretty. Kind of ugly. Kind of looks like a lump of mud. I mean, half the time. But in the hands of a skilled potter, that can become something absolutely beautiful and useful. And that is what God is so fantastic at at doing. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. God wants to take your mess and create something beautiful and useful out of it. But in order for him to do that, you have to let him. You have to take your sins to God. You have to take your mess and give it over to him. You have to repent and let him clean up the mess and heal you, and transform you. And last, the last lesson was remember the source of your blessings. You know, it's easy to slip into arrogance at times. Uh, It's easy to get full of ourselves, especially when things are going well. And it is a temptation we have to fight against. Forefront in our minds each and every morning. When you wake up, think about the truth that God is the source of all we have. I love James 1.17 says, for every good and perfect gift comes from above. Not you. You didn't work hard for it. God gave it to you. Every blessing we have comes from God, and so our attitude is that everything we do should give glory to God. Everything. So that's my prayer this morning is, is we take these lessons from Joshua. These are great lessons. You know, the Israelites goofed up. Okay, they goofed up. And so do we. But if we are repentant, if we turn our hearts to the Lord, if we seek his guidance, if we allow him to lead, we will share in his victory. That's his promise. I want to leave you with my, one of my favorite verses from Scripture. And it's, it's a verse that I think, think speaks very loudly to what Joshua and the Israelites experienced, but also what we are able to experience as well. All right, it's from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. You join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, I thank you so much for this wonderful day. And I thank you for this, um, you know, Chapter 8 in Joshua, I I thank you for the the turnaround, the comeback, where they got back on track, God, got back to being who they were supposed to be. And Lord, we know that we mess up and we get off track and that you call us to come back to you, that you call us to just come and and give over our sins to you, to repent from them, to learn from them, and that you will never turn your back on us. You love us so much that there is nothing that we could possibly do that would ever, ever cause us to lose your love. All we have to do is to repent and believe in the good news. So we thank you, Lord. Help us each day to live into that promise and help us to start each day, God, remembering that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you, as we close...